Hi, so in this video I'd like to talk a little bit about fraud analytics and a little bit about the process that you go through to try to get from a potential problem to collecting the data, getting it cleaned up, performing your analysis, and communicating the results. It, there are several steps in between and you have to go in order, otherwise your analysis will possibly fall through the cracks or not pr produce the results that you're expecting. So one of the things that's mentioned in your chapter three, your book, is the FBI definition of fraud. And we'd already looked at some definitions. So some key things here. First of all, the word intentional. We've already talked about that. You have to prove that it is not uh, an error. So if it's a, happened one time, it's likely not a fraud. Fraudsters usually keep going, uh, if nothing else, in hopes to pay back at some point. A perversion of the truth. So something that is not correct, not is not representing the truth, a lie. So you could tell a lie, it's raining outside. And if you could see outside right now, it's perfectly sunny. That's you're right, that is a perversion of truth. It probably was intentional, but in this case, it really didn't cause another person or another entity to rely on the truth, unless they packed an umbrella. But but that still doesn't give get us to the last point. So we have intentional, basically a falsification of the truth to another person or entity, that causes them to give up something of value. So that could be a variety of things. Now, with a misappropriation of assets, you, the fraudster is pretty much taking that something of value, uh, not willingly give up. But then there are frauds where uh, scams against individuals on the phone, they are asking them to give up uh, a credit card number or social security number to commit identity thaw fraud. So there's a wide definition. Of course, we're going to focus on occupational fraud, which is an employee against a company. But you can see how it applies in many other different situations. So there are actually 10 steps in the analytics approach. Now, some of these kind of combine together. So it's not like you go through each one individually. We'll kind of talk about that as you go. So the first thing is what kind of fraud or scheme do you think there's a risk of? Well, it could be a financial statement fraud and we feel that they're overstating sales. And then you ask, and what method are they using to overstate sales? Maybe it's channel stuffing at the end of the reporting period. So you would design and figure out what test. So you would call that your problem. Maybe we're looking for a cash skimming scheme. So we want to determine what ways could somebody uh, skim cash. So maybe if it, we have cash registers, that will restart. So you're really trying to define what type of fraud are you trying to detect? Well, based on that, we would try to look at what data is needed. So for a cash skimmy, we would need cash register receipts. We would need other details that might detect sales that weren't put into the cash register. So we determine, so the next three, the, so what data is needed, the next two kind of all go together. So basically you're trying to develop your plan. What data is needed? What, how would we test for this? And then what tools do we, can we do this in Excel? Do we need access? Do we need a more powerful tool? Do we need to program in R or Python? The next three steps are really about the data. So first of all, we need to figure out where we're going to get the data. Then we need to look at the reliability of the data. Now, some of this could be some initial analysis. The uh, profile that we're going to do is, can be part of this initial analysis. We're trying to get a picture of what the data is. So far, you've probably seen, and we'll, we'll get into a case later where you have to do the data cleansing. 
but probably most of the data you've seen in your classes, the data has been cleaned. It's been in the proper format. You haven't had to deal with uh, dates across the file being in different formats, things like that. So that's part of the whole getting your data ready. Then finally, step seven, uh, eight, we can actually run the test. So this is where we actually do our analysis and then we start to evaluate our results. And last, and I mentioned this before in other courses, you can do the best an analysis in the world, but if you can't communicate those results to somebody else, it doesn't matter. You're probably, the, you know, the results aren't going to be able to prove anything. You need to be able to communicate them either in a verbal report or a written report. So if we think about a typical audit technique, um, it's really based on sampling. So what you're trying to do is out of a million transactions, you're trying to find the one or the few that might be fraudulent. So if you think about audit, you got a million records and maybe you sample 1% of those. So 1% would be 10,000 records. So even if you look at that, you know, the um, fraudulent records could be in the 99%. What are your chances of getting to one, that one fraudulent record? Now, what analytics is trying to do is help us find, because of exceptions, this one fraudulent transaction here, or maybe the dozen fraudulent transactions out of a million records. And it's trying to eliminate that chance of finding it through sampling. It is trying to get us, because of patterns, because of recognition, flag certain transactions for further investigation. So we can spend our effort maybe on a couple hundred transactions rather than just a small sample of 1%. We could focus more accurately on those that are potential problems. Now, having a flag from a fraudulent analytic or a fraud analytics type of scheme is not a guarantee that they're fraudulent. It's only saying these are riskier or a higher potential. You still have to have human investigation to determine whether or not they're fraudulent. So one of the things we're trying to also do is compare actual results. So what are we finding in our data against trends of what we should be expecting? So based on what we know, what should we expect? Now this type of testing gives us a couple different uh, errors. One is a false positive. So these are transactions that show up as a fraud risk, but are fine but there's not really any problem with them. They comply with rules, but for whatever reason, they're showing up as a fraud risk based on whatever analysis we're doing. Now, you're always gonna get some of these, but what you wanna do is make sure you don't have 10,000 of these and only five are fraudulent, because that's a lot of manual effort to find. You need to get to a closer percentage. Now, a bigger risk are false negatives. These are transactions that are fraudulent, but slip through the data analysis process, so they are not shown as fraudulent. So as I kind of mentioned, fraud data analytics is not necessarily going to identify this, yes, this is a fraud, but it's a red flag. This is a potential problem. Then an auditor can evaluate and make a decision. In order to be able to take this to court, yes, you can use this as some of your evidence, but you would need additional evidence to be able to prove that a certain fraudster created those transactions. So in the exercise that you're going to do or the lab that you're going to do, you're going to create a data profile. Uh, and this is really a good idea to do uh, with any data in a data set before performing a test. It really just helps you get a lay of the land or get your bearings before uh, doing further testing. 
most of the time, you're not going to find any significant findings for this, um, anything that's really showing you a significant fraud risk, but it helps you to determine what potential subsequent testing you need to do, um, helps you with your plan, uh, and just, as I said, gives you as the auditor a little bit better understanding of the data before you move on. So I hope this gives you a little bit of understanding of what the process is as we move forward through each of these and so you understand a little bit more of what you do what you're going to do in the lab. We'll talk to you soon.